first job was cutting lawns. Newspaper girl. Shoveling snow, babysitting, and cutting lawns. What was your first job? And my job was to clean up the parking lot of the Dairy Queen. I was a garbage man. What did it teach you? I needed money and I needed to make my own money. It taught me what hard work is. I'm told that today there are no jobs. There's nothing out there. Nothing. But there are jobs out there. Yes, we are hiring. <laughs> and even some young workers do just fine. I'm only 16. I'm already getting paid more than most of my friends. Do internships exploit workers? The Obama administration says yes, but billionaire Mark Cuban says... The fact that we can't do them is just ridiculous. And this restaurant owner says the minimum wage kills first job. I'm, I'm doing good. Are y'all done? First jobs. That's our show tonight. And now, John Stossel. Tonight, the studio audience is filled with relatively young people, mainly because most are interns. Some work here at Fox, some work elsewhere in New York. Internships have become increasingly common in America, and today about half of college students do some kind of internship. It's a way for young people to build a resume, try work out. Also a way for companies to try workers out and for companies to get some work done cheap. Which raises the question, how many of you interns are paid? And I'm talking real wages here, not you know, ten dollars a day or something like that, huh? How many of you get paid? Nobody. Okay. <laughs> so aren't you being ripped off by these companies, exploited? Do you think you are? Nobody? <laughs> it's a Stossel Show audience. Well, the Obama Labor Department says they are exploited. Not long ago, it issued a fact sheet that says free internships are only legal if the employer derives no immediate advantage from the intern. What? <laughs> Why would an employer then want an intern? Also, the administration says it's better for the business if its operations may actually be impeded by the intern. Are you kidding me? What's the point of that? I had an intern like that once, and we agreed to part company. I think internships are great. I've used interns all my career. They've done some of my best research. Some went on to be journalists themselves. But lots of people say that it's about time the Labor Department started punishing companies that employ unpaid interns. Steve Greenhouse says that. He wrote The Big Squeeze, Tough Times for the American Worker. Hannah Jackman of the National Journalism Center helps students find internships and she says that they're great, paid or not. But, Stephen, you say most internships cause problems? What do you mean? No, I've written articles for my paper in the New York Times saying uh, experts say that many internships cause problems and that, and that you know, the Labor Department, not just under the Obama administration, but going back decades, has rules, has six criteria for when internships... But they've never been enforced, really, before. And, and the Obama administration really isn't enforcing them either. For the most part, <laughs> hence the right, witness right. the audience. And, and I was wondering, you know, why no one raised their hand because your employer would have said, how, how dare you say uh, I'm breaking the law by not paying you? The internship has to be for the benefit, almost the sole benefit of the intern. That it cannot be, as you said, John, for the immediate benefit of the employer. The, the Why not? I mean, aside from what the law, what the lawyers have worked out as a reporter, I mean, what's wrong with benefiting? It, it's win-win. It, it's win-win in many ways, but there are people who would, uh, with unemployment so high, many people are saying, well, it would be great if employers, instead of taking on all these smart young people uh, without paying them. They would hire people and pay them if it weren't for unpaid internships, that that replaces paying work? So in, I, I wrote this front page story a few weeks ago, John, where I, I uh, interviewed the workplace correspondent. Yes, workplace. Co so uh, I laid about a uh, graduate of a good college in, in, in uh, New York, and she was looking for a job in the fashion industry, got a, a job with one of the nation's most famous fashion houses. She said she worked basically from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, sometimes they wanted her to work weekends. She wasn't paid at all. She thought it was going to be educational. She said a lot of the time she twiddled her thumbs. She went out and got lunch for people. She ran errands. So she had a lousy time. She can quit. She's not a slave. That, that is absolutely true. But, you know, uh, 
we believe that companies should follow the rules. That's a good conservative notion. Companies should not break the law. And well, we the have dumb rules. Well, and then, 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 change, then, then change the rules. That people and companies should lobby the Labor Department to change the rules. Uh, Anna, but the, please, but, please, you weigh in here. You help students find internships. Absolutely. We um, place our interns in media organizations in Washington, D.C. And I can't say enough the, um, the advantages and importance of doing these kinds of internships, paid or unpaid. Um, they are incredible opportunities for students to learn what they want to do with their lives, incredible opportunities for networking, um, uh, incredible opportunities for learning how to be a, a grown-up young professional. Um, if if we force companies, yeah, it's great for the students, but it's hurting. He says it's hurting the paid workers. Um, I don't see how that's possible. A lot of these interns do the sort of work that that is not what a full-time employee would do, but sort of menial things. So it's not as if um, these interns are there in lieu of a full-time employee. Uh, Steve, I recently interviewed one billionaire. Uh, he's created lots of jobs, and he's upset about this Labor Department crackdown. Mark Cuban, he now owns the Dallas Mavericks, says he can't believe he's not allowed to give work to, uh, give unpaid work to college students. I get personally emails every day, 5, 10, 20, even more sometimes, saying it'd be my dream job to intern for the Dallas Mavericks. It'd be my dream job to work in any capacity, unpaid. As a matter of fact, Mark, I'll pay you to let me work for you. And so I went to our human resources person two years ago. I said, I have some projects I can really put these guys to work for. And he says, can't do it. It's just absolutely ridiculous. I agree. These are kids who might have invented something cool. They don't get the opportunity. They could, if, if, if Mr. Cuban, who I think might have a few extra cents to pay his interns, if he did pay, pay them, they could still be as creative and inventive and, and go on to exercise great things. But he and, chooses not to pay people to just take a flyer. These kids want to work for nothing for the experience. But unpaid internships favor wealthier kids from families who have connections. And uh, a lot of, if your family... Anna, make, what if about your family, that? If your family, I, look, I look at this audience, they look pretty prosperous to me. And, and <laughs> you know, if, if your family makes $500,000 a year, maybe they can afford to have their son or daughter work in New York City in an unpaid internship in the summer and pay fifteen hundred dollars a month rent but if a family only earns thirty thousand to fifty thousand there are certainly students um whose uh, whose parents are willing to support them as they go to a, another city and do an unpaid internship um however there are also kids um like me who work to put themselves through college who um who put away money while they were in college and uh took those savings and forayed them into um uh, an opportunity to do an unpaid internship. To say that because some students have the advantage of parental support that we should not allow any um, interns to have the opportunities at all, um, I think is, is robbing young people of an opportunity to, to follow their dreams and their careers. A lot of my interns said to me, you know, boy, I'm learning much more working for you than I learned in college. And I don't have to pay you anything. This is much better. Let me ask you interns, how many of you learn more in your internships than you did in college. <laughs> so that doesn't say much for college, but it sounds like an unpaid internship is a great deal. I, I'm not denying that unpaid internships can often be very educational. Again, you know, as someone, you know, we are a law-abiding society. We're supposed to follow the rules set forth by various levels of government. And, and it says here in the official Labor Department rules, if the interns are engaged in the operations of the employer or performing productive work, for example, filing, performing other clerical work, how many of you do that, uh, or assisting customers, then the fact that they may be receiving some benefits in the form of a new skill or improved work habits will not exclude them from the requirement that they be paid. Now, one might say the law is an ass, and that's been said before. Yeah, I'm not even sure what that law said, like most okay. laws. <laughs> uh, you know, but, think uh, but I, 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 I have think too many laws, and we should have a right of contract. And I, you, you're the workplace correspondent for the New York Times. The New York Times loves more laws and less freedom. In my I, opinion, <laughs> we um, love we love freedom. We love free. We love freedom of speech. We love freedom of religion. We're, we're big believers in freedom, but not freedom of contract in the workplace. We, we believe in. Freedom of contract. They made a contract but, with their employers. But why the Supreme can't... Court of the United States, you know, chosen by a duly elected president years ago, set forth these rules for how the workplace should be governed. Until they're changed by the Labor Department of the Supreme Court, those are the rules we're supposed to follow. 
So we're all lawbreakers here, and I'm guilty, too, because I've employed <laughs> lots of interns. Thank you, Stephen Greenhouse and Hannah Jackman. Next, we tell you about some teenagers in high school who are landing high-paying first jobs. How's that possible? Plus, stories about first jobs. Here's Bill O'Reilly. My first job at 16 was working in Carvel Ice Cream Stand. It taught me to show up on time. All right, first rule when you get a job, show up on time. Carvel, great, I got minimum wage, but all the hot fudge sundaes I wanted, good job, I wish I still had it. So he started at Carvel, other Fox personalities got their start working as a bus conductor, a garbage man. Their story's coming up. Today, there are no jobs. That's what I hear. But wait, one website that tracks job listings found almost 5 million job openings. In June, job openings rose by another 200,000. So what's going on? America has unusually high unemployment at the moment, but companies struggle to find workers? Fox Business reporter Sandra Smith looked into that. So what did you find out? Well, we recently went out to Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, we went to a co company called Air Products, where they on hand have over 600 job openings. We went to a small town and found jobs, John. So it's not altogether unreasonable to say that there are jobs out there that are going unfulfilled for long periods of time. And in many of these jobs, you don't even have to have a college education, most of which you do not have to have a college education. A lot of the people we talk to, young men, uh, simply had high school degrees. Let's, you did this report, let's play a clip. All we ever hear is that there's no jobs in America. What if I told you that in that building right there, high paying jobs sit vacant for sometimes up to a year? Are you actively recruiting? Absolutely. Every day. You can start at 20 or more dollars an hour. But most of America's college grads don't have the skills he seeks. Politicians in Washington love to push the importance of higher education. Higher education is not a luxury. But for many skilled workers, there's another path to the American dream. Vocational school. The kids who attend Lehigh Career and Technical Institute, they get jobs. I'm only 16. I'm already getting paid more than most of my friends. He just bought himself a car. Sold my old car and just got a new one uh, with the money I, have, I had made. Nick Sinetti learned technical skills in high school. You had many job offers, as I understand it. A few out of high school, yes. So you didn't go to college? I didn't want to go to college, really. I have a brother right now. I just got out of college with a master's degree, and he's having a lot of trouble finding uh, a job in his field. So the guy with the master's degree yeah. can't find a job, but the tech student gets it. Yeah, it kind of brings a smile to my face looking at those guys that I interviewed because they're proud of what they do. And they said simply college just wasn't for them. Their families in some cases couldn't afford college. They're making money, bought a new car, they All live right, on their own. This is not cool in America. Vocational school isn't glamorous. President Obama wants more money for liberal arts colleges, he even proposed cutting support. I think all support should be cut, but he, even he wants to wanted to cut support for vocationals. Well, I think it's a lot more cool to have a job and be able to buy a new car than it is to not be able to do that and sit at home without a job. But, John, I would wholeheartedly agree that there's a major push from Washington. Go to college. Go to a four-year university. Take out the student loans if you have to. But why aren't we saying that there's another route? In fact, the CEO of that company that I went out to visit in Pennsylvania, John McLeod, he was a vocational school kid. He came out of vocational school, got a job at that company decades ago, has risen to the top of the company. He did attend college. Uh, he ended up going back and getting a higher education. He now makes over $10 million a year. Okay, that's good. And the Department of Labor says it predicts job openings for the future. They assume uh, maybe 14% employment growth, uh, growth overall. But electricians, they say, 23%. Plumbers and pipe fitters, 26%. Heating, air conditioning, refrigeration mechanics, 34%. So the, this is where the jobs are. 
These jobs are going unfulfilled, and in this particular case, some of these jobs op are open over a year, we were told. So vocational school graduates, there's work out there, and for people who want to do these jobs, there's work. Thank you, Sandra Smith. Next, polls show most Americans think it's a good idea to raise the minimum wage. Who would be against that? Well, I am. I say a minimum wage kills first jobs. And later, Shep Smith, Greta Van Susteren, and others talk about their first jobs. My first job was uh, at a delicatessen, and I became the manager of it. I told them I had considerable experiences making um, you know, my, my sandwiches, my lunch at home. You know how kids have lemonade stands? Uh -huh. Well, I took it one step further, did lemonade. I would sell bags. I'd, sell, I'd go buy stuff and sell it for more. Shoveling snow, babysitting, and cutting lawns. My first real job, though, was as a janitor on the weekends in an engineering firm for Dollar Hyde, DeCamp, and Brown. A couple years ago, Congress raised the minimum wage to $7.25 an hour. Now some congressmen want to raise it to $10 an hour. And that sounds reasonable. It's more like a closer to a living wage. And it's logical to think that raising the minimum will give every worker a little more to spend. And that'll be good for them and the economy. They'll spend, people will hire more. Yippee, it's win-win. It's no surprise that two-thirds of Americans support a $10 minimum wage. One of the congressmen who sponsored the $10 minimum is Minnesota Democrat Keith Ellison. He tells me that without the minimum wage... An employer will pay the least they can, even if they could pay more, because why they can get away with it. People would be paid 10 cents, 2 cents, 3 cents. Well, it sounds logical, except if it's only the law that prevents greedy employers from paying 2 cents or 10 cents an hour, how come most Americans get paid more than minimum wage? What's going on here? Well, let's ask a businessman. Merv Christ owns a restaurant and bar in Bakersfield, California, called The Prime Cut. Now, you pay most of your workers above minimum wage. Well, about half's above, and about the other half is, is hostess and So why and pay any of them above minimum wage? You don't have to. Well, they've, they've learned skills in their, in their work life that I, if I don't pay them that, someone else will pay them more. And that's because of the knowledge they've learned. You have to pay them more because of competition. Absolutely. To keep them. Absolutely. Something called the free market. Who thought that that could raise people's <laughs> wages? A lot of your employees start at the minimum wage and then work them work their way up. Absolutely. That's the way that's the ones that don't have the knowledge already need it. Interns. They want the knowledge. If the knowledge is the is the information. The information's the the, the wealth, that's how you make it. So you've built a business. You started off with three employees. You created jobs. You have 28 employees now. Uh, top employees earn about $18 an hour. Um, Somewhere near, yeah, yeah. The average hourly wage in America is sixteen fifty-seven an hour, well above minimum wage. So the market sets it for 95% of the workers. What's wrong with having a law just to put a, a bottom on it? Well, it takes people who don't have any experience and it cuts them out of the market. You don't want to bring in uh, a, 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 an employee that doesn't know anything. I mean, literally, some of the high school kids at my old place, we used to have a lot of the high school kids come in and they'd work in the deli. Uh, we moved to the restaurant. Now some of the high school kids come in, they want a job. I have to teach them how to clean a toilet because they don't even know how to just clean a toilet. California just raised its minimum to eight bucks an hour, a little more than the national average. Mm -hmm. What's, what does that hurt? Like I said, the inexperienced worker, the person that doesn't doesn't have experience. Because they, they don't get hired. Yeah, because they don't you, get hired, keeps pushing them off. So you just don't hire them? No, we find someone that, that has a little bit of experience and hire maybe for a little bit more if you have to. So fewer workers get hired. Yes. And fewer I, workers get a chance. And I get to work harder. <laughs> uh, so how do you feel when politicians say, you have to pay someone at least this much? I feel like it's pandering in the highest degree. It's... It, it, takes away from my ability to run my business. Try running a business. Uh, you know, I hear them say that if you're paying a few more cents or a dollar an hour more and it, it puts you out of business, we well, have a bad business model. Well, I've been doing this 19 years. I'm still in business. I've gone from three employees to 28 employees or so. I'm proud of that. When I was a kid, you'd go to a movie theater, there'd be an usher. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
No more ushers. No more people washing your windshield at gas stations. Oh, nobody filling up your tank for you. Because of the minimum wage? Absolutely. I remember when I was a kid, there was an old man that just loved the Fox Theater, and he would stand there and shine a little light on your ticket, take you down to your chair, and he got paid hardly anything. But he loved movies. He was retired. He wanted to do something. Can't do it anymore. It's illegal. It's, Ill it's against the law. Your first job was what? Oh, I was working food service. I think I was bussing and doing some other stuff, like two twenty-five an hour. And when I was young, that, was not, that wasn't bad. It was better than not having a job. My father and mother, you know, instilled work ethic. You do, you work. You don't say, should I jump? You say, how far should I jump? When the boss says jump. They also used to hire people on construction sites, kids who would learn on the job. Oh, absolutely. That's gone, too. Oh, high school, uh, Prop 13, you don't have the, the uh, jobs learning how to weld and do all that kind of stuff anymore either. Because so. it's illegal for the employer to, to just bring a kid on and see if he's good at it. Well, for free, yeah. <laughs> for free or for four bucks an hour for or intern, six bucks yeah, an hour. Whatever they're willing to work for. But the public supports higher minimum wage. Uh, a survey of economists found two-thirds who specialize in labor law and labor economics say it does kill jobs. But the public doesn't get that. Well, more of the public should be an employer and understand how, how much goes into providing jobs and you know, an $8 an hour job, by the time you get done with taxes and everything else, you know, you're paying $14 for that person to get $8. You're pushing inflation. Everything, everything goes up because of that. You're, just, you're making money now. You're just a selfish, rich guy who doesn't <laughs> want to share. <laughs> um, I'm doing my social responsibility by, by keeping a business running in a, in a poor economy and making sure that I can pay people and teaching people how to work. And, you know, like O'Reilly says, show up on time. I say, if your shoes aren't tied... I probably don't want to talk to you. <laughs> Merv Chris, thank you very much. Next, Brett Baer, Shep Smith. Others tell stories about their first jobs. My first job, uh, I guess, was a short order cook. My first job was at what was then known as Spa Lady, where I became a little aerobics instructor in another life, and as I like to say, another body. I worked at a deli, and I had to um, chop up raw fish for this fish salad this German lady made, and so that was disgusting, and I didn't work there very long. What was your first job? Asking around this building, I was struck by how many people delivered newspapers. 13 years old, I became a Long Island Press delivery boy. A newspaper girl. I was delivering papers when I was uh, 11 or 12. And lots of people said their first job was restaurant work. My job was to clean up the parking lot of the Dairy Queen. I was washing dishes Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I was eight years old. And I worked at my father's bakery. I washed the pots and pans. I scraped the floors. I don't even child think I, labor. I don't violation. even think I got paid. America makes it illegal to work when you're young. But there's an exception if you work for your family. My job is working in my family's restaurant at a very young age. They started me at eight years old cleaning the tables, and then I was promoted to hostess and then promoted to waitress. And they used to, I used to, my dad used to make me work shift after shift when waitresses would call off. And I would work all these shifts in a row, and I'd get so angry at him because he'd send all the other waitresses home. Some people talk about how hard they had to persist just to get a first job. Going around town asking the business owners if I, they would pay me to sweep their sidewalks and their parking lots. Some persisted even when the money wasn't good. My first job was mowing lawns at the University of Denver for the princely sum of a buck fifteen an hour. And when the work was boring. Okay, my first job was in the back room of a dairy in Appleton, Wisconsin, and I had the job of getting all the coins from the cash register and putting all the pennies in those paper rolls. Then I put all the nickels in those paper rolls and the dimes in the quarters in paper rolls. So I spent about eight hours a day stuffing those uh, paper rolls, and they would go off to the bank. Many worked long hours. Working school nights till 2 a.m., and my mom would pick me up at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> she was raising five kids, not just me. And the third night this happened, she said, Billy, you need to find another job. <laughs> Shannon Breen helped her mother renovate houses. I had a little scraper tool, and I had to go around to every pane of glass after they were painted and scrape off any glue, any paint that was left on there. Charles Payne worked at a little shop in Harlem. It was a tough gig. 
uh, you know, it was, a, it was a, you know, you did the snoring, you did the register, but also I was in a location where I had to also be a security guard as well. And uh, that was a pretty tough one. That's all I can tell you. Today, some laugh about the hard work. I was a garbage man. Uh, and it was one of those guys who rode on the back of the truck. You know, you jumped off and they, all the pails were there and you threw them in. And they didn't have like plastic ones back then. They had those big heavy metal things. And you throw them in and sometimes you pick this thing up and you go, whoa. And the hard work taught valuable lessons. Did it change my life? It most certainly did. Um, I decided I never wanted to ever, ever, ever be a professional uh, person who puts those money in those paper things. It was dreadfully dull, and I decided I have to have a job that's fascinating. And of course, I always wanted to be a lawyer because I knew I'd always be in trouble, and I'd never be able to afford a lawyer, so I'd better be a lawyer. So I ultimately became a lawyer. Only a few of my colleagues found early jobs in the field we're in now. They were giving away airtime as a contest, be a DJ for an hour. And uh, so I was, and I was... Well, what did you do to win the contest? Twelve. Oh, you entered a playlist. You said, you know, what songs would you play? And I really thought, okay, now what does the station sound like? can't believe that they gave me a key to a radio station and let me open it up, sign it on the air, and, uh, you know, do everything from news and disc jockey and sports. And it was a terrific job. And I found only one other person who really liked his first job. first job I had was between ages 16 and 20 when I worked in the summers as a sailing instructor in a day camp and what it taught me was that there are people in the world who when you're doing a job that you would do for nothing will actually pay you and when they're offering it don't object most first jobs were not much fun they didn't have a dishwashing machine i used to have to wash pots and pans and scrub and all the plates and it was a busy restaurant i could tell you what my worst job was it was it was washing dishes in an industrial kitchen at a hospital the dishwasher was so big, you walked into the dishwasher. And I've never been so wet, so humid, so hot uh, any time in my life. But most everyone said they're grateful for the lessons they learned. It taught me that if you work hard, you can, um, you know, you can earn things and accumulate things and, and do with it what you will. It taught you the value of work and also the dignity of work. There's something about, you know, getting it yourself. It taught me that uh, you had to keep showing up for work. It taught me to be punctual because if people don't get their newspaper, they're very angry. What it taught me was that um, I could do better than minimum wage. And I went out the next summer, bought my own lawn mower, and I would charge people eight bucks to mow their lawns. And I would do it in about an hour. And I got a much better, I had a much more lucrative business working for myself. I learned that if I wanted to buy anything for myself, I needed money and I needed to make my own money. So it was a lesson I learned very early on that I wasn't entitled to anything. So it was uh, in all regards, it was really the beginning of a life that, uh, you know, as a capitalist. I learned it was kind of a hoot, even that early in the morning, to make a little money. Stuart Varney's first job was working in one of these double-decker buses in London taught me a lot. How do you deal with drunks? I learned how to do that. How do you learn to deal with the general public? Well, you get a lot of that as a London transport bus conductor. It also taught you punctuality. You may not be late when appearing for your shift. It was one of the toughest jobs I ever had, but I'm glad I did it. Reason TV's Nick Gillespie learned a lesson he wasn't supposed to learn. I worked as a page in my hometown library in Middletown, New Jersey. I was supposed to put books away, uh, you know, as they came, as they were returned. I took a, uh, a cart of books and I put, I restocked them in about 20 minutes and I came back and I said, okay, where's the next rack? And the people who worked there, this was a municipal library, they were like, what, you're done? And I was like, yeah, that, you know, this is great work. Uh, you know, let me, let me do some more. And they were like, no, you were supposed to take two hours to put those away. Now just go away and come back at the end of your shift. And what I learned from that was I don't want to work in the public sector. Whatever the job, most everyone said they learned just by working. Gave me the work ethic that I have now. It taught me what hard work is. And then I worked every other job in the restaurant business. Then I moved on to the construction business. And somehow I thought, let me try this radio and TV thing. And I've been very blessed. Even if the job would be illegal today. I was 13 years old, and I went to work at Tyson's Drugstore, and you're not supposed to drive at 13. You may have heard about that, but at the time, at 14 and a half in Mississippi, you could get your driver's license. I don't know. They gave me my start, and then Hardee's after that, but that's another story. Stossel! Back to you. <laughs>
And when we return, back to you. That is, you viewers and you in our studio audience, you interns get to question our guests. We're back with your questions for my guest, Stephen Greenhouse, the author who says interns are abused. Hannah Jackman, who finds students internships, and restaurant owner Merv Crest, he's upset about the minimum wage. But first, for my Facebook page, uh, Mary Aho says, any legal job is a contract between employee and employer. As long as interns aren't forced to work free, or the contract isn't breached, what right does government have to interfere? And this also applies to minimum wage. And I think she makes a lot of sense. Stephen? First, John, I, I didn't say all interns are abused. I, I said some experts. also? Yeah, I said some experts say that uh, there are various employers who are breaking the law by not paying their interns. Some. Okay. okay. So, Bad things so, are happening. Yes. I say good things are happening. Yes. So, why do countries enact minimum wage laws? You know, people who oppose Because minimum politicians are dumb? Maybe. Uh, maybe they're smart. Maybe they're all above average. I doubt that. Um, <laughs> but um, clearly, uh, the government's going back uh, many, many years decided that we have to set a floor for wages because, you know, when unemployment is as high as it is, uh, 13 million people and are unemployed. They know what the floor is. Well, one How could they, but one could debate what what the right floor is. You're absolutely right. If John. government can just lift us, if eight dollars is good, why not twenty dollars? Why not a hundred dollars an hour? We'll all be better off. Exactly. I think all these governments have enacted a minimum wage because they feel, uh, with unemployment high, some workers might be forced to say. I'll work for $2 an hour. I'll work for 50 cents an hour. And governments are stepping and saying there's an imbalance in this freedom of contract. We have to step in to make sure people will make a decent living so they don't have to rely on taxpayers for welfare or, or Medicaid or things like that. So they're just trying to set a minimum floor so people can live decent lives. Just before we go to the audience, either of you two want to comment on that? Well, spe specifically on the minimum wage side. Um, it's a, it's a learning wage. It's an entry-level wage. It has nothing to do with, with making a living. It's for kids going to high school, kids going through college. You're living at home. You're, you know, there's other support systems for you to understand. Show up on time. Do the other basic things to have a job. Well, now it's illegal. Yes. In your opinions, is academic credit a fair substitute for a salary in these entry-level jobs or internships? Yeah, Hannah, you start with that. You notice more and more there's bureaucratic demand prove you get credit. Absolutely. If you contract with the employer and say that in exchange for this work that I'm going to do for you as an intern, you're going to offer me um, academic credit, that um, that's fine. I think that if you contract with the employer and say in exchange for this experience, um, I won't be paid or I will be paid some small amount, a stipend, a scholarship, uh, an hourly wage, um, that's fine too. I think there are lots of different how about arrangements your, that work. How about if you get no money, no credit? No money, no credit, I think is, is fair. Um, you know, once you start making demands on companies to pay you or offer you academic credit, they may very well say, I don't want the hassle and not offer those opportunities at all. So I would rather see. I just want to want to add to that. ABC, where I used to work, they were always in tune with the latest in Democratic Party thinking. And they decided, you know, we can't have these internships where we don't pay anybody. And they decided before it was publicized that it was illegal. They had, we're going to pay everybody ten dollars an hour. And that's great for those well-connected internships who got the interns who got the job, but they cut the internships in half. There were far fewer opportunities. Exactly. I would rather see interns have the opportunities to intern um, rather than not have those opportunities at all. And that is the unintended consequence of forcing companies to give academic credit or give um, money for um, internships. Yes. This is from Mr. Greenhouse. Um, you mentioned earlier that only wealthier students, or a lot of times students from wealthier families, can take advantage of these unpaid internships. My parents certainly aren't wealthy. In fact, my mother's on SSI. So what would you say to the, the students that don't have wealthy parents that still saved money for several years, tucked it away, and, and was able to take advantage of this opportunity? It's great if they could get internships, but you know, who's going to pay their rent in Manhattan? Uh, you know, where they get the money to pay them. So it's really hard. So unfortunately... Where do you get the money to pay your rent? I worked for several summers. In fact, I started a small video business and filmed weddings for two years. That's great. That's, That's I great. I admire you. Yes, go ahead. So earlier, Sandra was talking about how many people um, don't really realize the opportunities behind, like, vocational school. Do you think that with the unemployment rate being so high and the, the 
to deterioration of our economy, do you think that a lot of people will be switching and maybe going to vocational school more? Or do you think that people are going to continue going to universities and colleges and paying um, off their student student loans like in the years to come? And- I think some people who might otherwise have gone you know, to college to get a bachelor's degree are saying, well, instead of majoring in philosophy, maybe I'll major in nursing. Or instead of... Uh, uh, you know, getting a BA in, 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 in biology, maybe I should become an engineer because there's a shortage of engineers. But by and large, you know, the studies show that you know, those with a college degree earn you know, $300,000 $400, more a year, more in their lifetime than someone with just a high school degree. So I think by and large, it's a very good idea to get a college degree. And some, sometime the economy should right itself and the unemployment rate will drop. And I think the payoff for having a college degree will be even bigger. So a lot of you will be deep in debt, and it's not for everybody. But thank you, Stephen Greenhouse, even though we disagree about everything. <laughs> Hannah Jackman. We, we, we agree about, about college, Chris. John. Coming up, I'll tell you about my first job. <laughs> my first job was on an assembly line. I stuck pieces of plastic and metal together for a company called Apico. That stands for American Photocopy Equipment. Here's one of their ads. On the assembly line, I wasn't smiling like this woman is. I hated the job. It was hot and boring. But working there made me eager to get good grades in school so I might have other choices. And four years later, I got a job as a researcher at a TV station. One day they needed someone to cover a fire. No one else was around, so they put me on the air. And to my surprise, that became a career. I say surprise because I never planned to be a TV reporter. I didn't even watch TV news. I never took a journalism course. It's why I think you interns are doing the right thing. Experimenting with careers, figuring out what you like, what you're good at, what you're not good at. And I have one other piece of advice for you. It's important to keep showing up, to apply for the job you want. And if you don't get it, apply again. Job seekers often assume companies are organized, that there's this personnel office that carefully evaluates each applicant. So people drop off their resumes and wait to hear. But often that's not how it works. Often companies are disorganized. They they don't want to spend any money to hire anyone until suddenly they need someone right now. And then it's tedious to go through all those resumes on file. But they remember the intern who was helpful last summer. Or the kid who just shows up repeatedly, eagerly asking for work. That persistent person is often the one who gets hired. That's how Martha McCallum got a job. My first job was at the Village Cheese Shop in Wyckoff, New Jersey. I think I went in there once a week for about six weeks and bugged them every time I went in, asking them if they needed anybody for after-school help. They finally hired her. Now, it's no fun to just show up and keep asking, but it does work. Outside a nearby welfare office, I was told recently, there are no jobs. There's nothing out there. Nothing. No jobs around? No. Really? I asked my team to check that out. Within a few blocks of that welfare office, they found lots of businesses that want to hire people. Yes, we are hiring. (laughs) This frozen yogurt store wishes more people would apply. We need like two or three people at all the time, basically. Of 79 businesses that we ask in less than two hours, 40 said they would hire. 24 said they'd take people with no experience. The owner of this restaurant said he'd hire lots of people. How many? About 12 to 14 people. I would hire more than that, but, uh, you know, the hardest thing is to get good help. So right after that interview, I told two job seekers about that restaurant. Both said, great, I'll apply. One waited for the start of Business Monday and dropped off his resume. He thought that was more professional. But he still hasn't been offered a job. The other job seeker just showed up the next day, Saturday, Saturday morning. He got the job, and he's here. Herman, would you stand up? Uh, tell, Tell us what happened. You just showed up? Yeah, I showed up and I applied. And he said, okay, I'll hire you. He put you in the, uh, in the kitchen, hot, difficult work, minimum wage. But within a few days, you were making more than minimum wage? Yes, I became a waiter. And some of the waiters make 100 to 150 bucks a night at this place. That's correct. So you want to go to graduate school someday? A restaurant is not going to be a career for you, but is it, what are you learning? Is it worth it? It is worth it. It's actually a great experience. 
Why? I meet successful people every day, and they give me great advice and tips on how to become successful. I love it. I love going there every day and learning new stuff. is like a stepping stone. All right, just from showing up and asking for the job. And that's what I tell job seekers. You can't really know what you like or what you're good at. Just show up. Apply. Apply again. Try stuff. Work hard. Try other stuff. Become an intern. You can sit down, Chairman. How how many how many of your of you interns think your current internship will lead to a career in that same field? Fewer of you, but I agree. It's a wonderful experience. But now your government wants to make most internships illegal. Give me a break. Internships are great. Vocational schools are great. Low wage first jobs are great. And the best hope for prosperity is if government gets out of our way and allows those things to happen. That's our show. We'll have a new one next Thursday, 9 p.m. on the Fox Business Network. Thanks for watching.